Yeah. Oh, nice, we'll kick off. Yeah. Um, so Mark, can you tell us a bit about your first recruitment experience and how things have changed for you? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, my first recruitment experience was uh, the experience of being hired through the law firm hiring process, which has a fairly unique process, I, I gather, uh, in that you know, as you're coming to the end of your degree at university, the various law firms are vying for candidates to, um, to join them. And so you end up kind of being hunted down in a way, or wooed at least. Uh, you know, you put in your application for a bunch of law firms and you cross your fingers and hope that uh, you might get an offer or at least an interview. And I was fortunate enough to get a number of interviews and got at least uh, more than one offer. And uh, so uh, that was a pretty somewhat surreal experience, to be fair, because yeah. although I'd worked in jobs, you know, sort of um, other jobs in your student days, student type jobs, uh, this was your first kind of real proper job. Uh, and I had no real taste of what that was going to look like. And to have people kind of woo you and dine you and invite you to drinks and, and try and basically sell themselves to you, you're kind of like, well, I don't, I don't understand this, but this is great. Uh, so, um, I will ask no questions. <laughs> so, uh, and I guess, uh, being in the fortunate position to have more than one offer, I, I mm. had to decide, okay, well, how am I going to decide between these firms? And it really came down to a matter of culture. And, you know, I had to try to gather, okay, from the interview, from, uh, what others said of those firms, what would be the best fit for me in terms of culture, in terms of what I, um, where I felt I would fit and work and enjoy the, the time, you know, that you're going to spend day in, day out with these people. Um, where do I think I'd be fit? And, um, for me, that was Buttle Findlay, uh, in Auckland and, um, I, yeah, really enjoyed my time there. So it was a great move. It's great having that early understanding of choice, but also where, where am I going to thrive? What values align best with who I am and where I want to go in my career? Yeah. Uh, so speaking to that, what made you want to become a specialist in employment law and civil litigation? Yeah, well, that's also a funny question in a sense, and a, an unusual thing that happened for me, I guess, is that I never really wanted to be an employment lawyer. I didn't want to be a litigation uh, specialist. Actually, when I was uh, in my early days of um, my legal career, I thought the, the lawyers who were in the litigation department were a bit, a bit crazy, uh, that seemed kind <laughs> of, um, a bit eccentric and yeah. I, and they seemed to work quite long hours and really get stuck into what they were doing and, 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 um, in their own little world. And I, I just thought, I don't want to be part of that. That's weird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I was quite happy with the idea of just pushing some paper uh, you know, um, you know, doing some, some challenging things, but yeah. not at the forefront of having to go to court and go to battle and, um, and yeah. all that comes with that. Uh, so I had, was on a track and in your first year at a law firm, uh, like Butter Finlay, I was uh, on a rotation. So I'd have rotation through two, um, two areas of the, of the firm to get a taste, I suppose, of what it's mm. like to work in these firms or in these areas of law that maybe you haven't experienced before. And for me, uh, the first rotation was in IP, so intellectual property law, which I really enjoyed. And I thought that was where I was going to stay. And my next rotation was going to be in banking. So both kind of areas where you're, you're dealing with, um, I guess, non-contentious stuff for most of the time you're dealing with, you know, moving paper around, I suppose. Um, and that that's kind of um, the focus. Um, and I, uh, got a call one day halfway between, um, almost towards the end of my first rotation from the HR lady who said, Hey, look, sorry, the person who is in banking at the moment, um, she really wants to stay in banking. So she doesn't want to rotate out of there. Uh, yeah. and the banking team are quite happy for her to do that. And so that means there's no slot for you in banking. Uh, but we have a slot for you in the litigation department and the employment law team. And like, perfect. Perfect. And I thought, you know, what she's really saying to me is you're going to the employment law team, you know, she wasn't. Really yeah. Uh, and for me, that was, I was like, okay, well, I'll just go for this ride. I, for me, I, I got my worst mark in employment law at university. Right. So it wasn't yeah. like it was something that was on my 
radar as something I wanted to try and do. But yeah. when I got into the team, I worked with some really great people, got some really good opportunities first up, oh, and great. I was really just sort of uh, thrown into it. And mm. and that um, I guess the the opportunity to really test myself and grow really quickly uh, and deal with clients face to face in a way that I wouldn't have had the opportunity in other teams to do uh, was really cool. And I really enjoyed it. And I, I enjoyed the human aspect of employment law in particular because you're dealing with people's lives um, yeah. and uh, you know the impact that it has on them from day to day. So that for me, um, yeah, I, that's how I ended up in it. And I haven't moved, there, moved from it since. And um, it's been sort of 15 or 16 years later I think something like that well, it's 2004 anyway so yeah it's amazing chosen pivots versus forced pivots within a career um and we had Tiana Epate the president of the NZ Law Society on our Her Career podcast and she states her father was also a lawyer and was trying to dissuade her from becoming one um but spoke very impassionately about how important that role is you talked about going to battle for people and you know this is a time particularly civil litigation where there are some pretty important life matters at, at stake mm. so how do you deal with that how um have you found that ride because it would have been quite i don't know if it's confronting the right word or at least you know a huge amount of responsibility walking into that area yeah i think i was fortunate to learn from some really good people and I think the benefit of working in a firm is that you see how different people deal with that stuff. Right, and yeah. so you end up picking the best parts or what, or what, thing, what yeah. things you really in, enjoy or, or um, admire about different people and the way that they work. And you then kind of make your own mix of that stuff and you take that with whatever you bring to it as well. Uh, out. Mm. So I suppose uh, that is the benefit of working in a team, working in that kind mm. of... Uh, corporate environment where you do have that exposure to the way different people operate and for me that was just invaluable and I, I look back on it and I think oh yeah I do certain things in the way that I operate and I think oh, yeah, I got that from that person in the way that they yeah. did it and um, and I've sort of just absorbed it unthinkingly in a way but it's it's become something that you do and um, and so I yeah I, I really value that and I, I had some people who were mentor type people in my life in that in those spaces and at various parts of my time there uh who really just uh, gave me the opportunity and the nudges and the direction that was just what i needed so um yeah. i guess that's that's the stuff you look back on in retrospect and say yeah. hey that's how i got through that and that's uh what's been so valuable about it yeah yeah, and that's why having a great team is so important because we are learning by osmosis um, subconsciously and so how we kind of carry forward is a, a great culmination of those people we're exposed to. This is a question probably for the graduates uh, that will be interested in understanding what you've gone through in your career. Did you find the legal profession has matched the expectations you had from law school? Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, you know, no, Rosie, yeah, yeah, no. no. And I'll be interested to know what whether other people in other professions feel the same way. But certainly in yeah. law school, um, you know, you're taught to think through legal problems and read cases and uh, yes. and it's all quite academic in a sense. Uh, yeah. But you're not taught necessarily. I mean, you do some client negotiation and um, client interviewing and, and that kind of um preparation but until you actually are sitting down at a desk and you've got a person's problem on your plate and it's a real life thing and yeah. you feel the urgency of it and the weight of it um that's a that's just that's just different it's something that you can't really you can't um i guess prepare yourself for until you actually just got in the thick of it and gone okay this is how we're going to deal with this situation and you know, even just basic stuff like how do you how do you write a letter? I mean, I remember my first days sitting right. down with a dictaphone because I'd never used a dictaphone before, and they were training you how to use a dictaphone. Um, and we had an open plan office, so yeah. uh, you couldn't see people, but they could hear you because the, we had these yeah. high partitions. But you know, I was right. quietly trying to dictaphone away because uh, I was quite embarrassed that I didn't quite know how to start this letter. 
you know. And, <laughs> and I realized, oh, actually, at law school, they never taught you how to write a letter. Like, how do you start that? And how do you, how do you correspond with people? And what's the appropriate things to say? Uh, and I, I guess that's, um, that's where uh, those skills and those, like, is it soft skills, I suppose you, you would say, mm. are the things that you just have to learn on the job. And so long as you've got a supportive team around you and a good group of people that you know you can go to and learn from, um, you're going to be fine. Uh, yeah. But it is something that is a bit of a shock. And I think from law school, you know, turning up to a workplace every day with the same people, you know, nine to five, or eight thirty to six, or whatever it was, um, uh, that was also a shock because it's like, what? I have to see you every day. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I can't just stay home and skip a lecture. You know. <laughs> um, so all of that, you know, real world stuff, um, yeah. I guess you're never quite prepared for, but, um, but, you know, having a supportive firm environment was, was fantastic to get you through that. And so I've really valued that time. Yeah. I think that's just a magnificent example because something like writing a letter, which you think from a university perspective, they might think, no, you know, we need to get these really technical skills into these young lawyers that um sometimes step one and two are missed yeah that's right <laughs> yeah exactly um it's funny you know it's these practical things that are overlooked but actually end up yeah. being some of the most important things um and so um i suppose if you to to say to graduates what could you do to get yourself in a position it's nine o'clock where you're beneficial sorry i had that <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, where you have the uh, benefit of um, uh, or, or that you stand out would be getting yourself in a position where you have a summer job or something that gets you mm. some of that practical skill stuff happening for you uh, whether that's I don't know what that might be whether it's working for a, a community group or something where you're drafting letters or dealing with people you know meeting with them face to face and um, that sort of thing uh, would be really, really valuable. I know there's some community law centres that have internship programs uh, where people can, you know, start interviewing real world clients and dealing with their real world, world issues and writing letters for them and that sort of thing. Um, that kind of volunteer work would be really helpful. Yeah, that's a great piece mm. of advice. Thanks, Mark. So you moved from Buttle Finlay, which is a leading national law firm, to provide your services independently. Why did you do that? And how did you make that decision? Yeah, um, that uh, was an interesting one, I guess, for me. And it was an interesting one from everyone else's perspective, too, because it's not probably normal for people to have moved out so soon uh, in right. their career. But for me, I had had it modeled to me that um, that's what you did. My dad had always worked for himself. My sister had worked for herself. My brother had. And I, I guess I had it ingrained in me. That that's what that's what you should do. That's what you should aim for. I just, I, I hadn't known it any other way, if you know what I mean. So yeah. um, that was one aspect of it. The other aspect was uh, I also, um, I have this thing in me where I like to make efficiencies and improve things. And I like to use, to use technology to help that along. And some of the things that we, that I saw in a big corporate environment um, uh, were hard to move the needle on were some of those efficiency gains. Um, because you know you've got to have a board decision that um, can um, make changes to software or you know um, or improve a, a process that's going to get rolled out to the whole firm. It's a big deal to make a change like that in a big firm, and I understand that. I mean, you can't just make changes like that overnight. You're going to upset people, um, and it's a cost to it as well. And so you can't be as nimble, um, I suppose, just the way the way it is. And for me, that was a little bit frustrating too. So um, the other thing was, um, there were some clients I felt like I wanted to help, but I, I couldn't. We, we, you know, I had to I had to charge at a certain level. I couldn't just make decisions about what would be charged to, that, to those people, um, uh, because really, at the end of the day, it's the firm's decision, not mine. And mm. I wanted to be able to make those decisions too. So there, there was a few few decisions around. Um, around working on my own that seemed like a good idea to give it a go and at the time my wife and I had um, were newly married we didn't have kids and I knew that once we did have kids um, I think that decision to make the leap would be a little bit harder 
And so I thought, okay, now's the time. And you know what, if I fall flat on my face in six months time, I would go cap in hand back to the firm and say, can you have me back? And I, yeah. I, I don't think I burned any bridges. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think they were possibly expecting I would come back um, if I did fall, <laughs> fall, my, fall on my face. Um, but uh, it, it's gone well since. And, um, and so that they have actually been still supportive. You know, they still send work my way um, in, in right. that sense. So I still uh, am grateful for the relationship I have with the firm. And, um, and I think for me, it, it had worked out um, that um, uh, going out on my own does, has, has been uh, a good thing for me, good for my family life, um, and good because I can make these decisions that I feel like, okay, I can help this person, I'm not going to charge them X. Um, and also I can make these efficiency gains in the way that I run my, um, my, my systems, which means I can be a bit more nimble, um, that sort of thing. So yeah, there's, it's, I guess that was the leap, uh, of faith. And there's been a few people in the employment law field who have done that at a younger mm. age, because it is a, a more discreet field. You, you know, you have discreet bits of work that you can pick up. Uh, it doesn't require massive, you know, um, uh, support to be able to, um, represent someone, uh, in a, uh, what is, might be a, a fairly smallish matter and, you know, you drop into their lives for maybe a, a number of weeks and then you drop out yeah. again. And yeah. that, that is something that, um, uh, is, uh, the kind of work that you are able to pick up, um, because people just need that amount of support. They don't need years and years of support, which is something that perhaps a firm is going to provide you in a better way. So, so that was kind of, um, why and I guess how it's kind of worked out for me. So, yeah. Yeah, I can understand that from the other side of the coin. I worked for CCH Walters Kluwer for five years. So selling into legal firms and accountancy businesses, um, both large firms and, and individuals. So I, um, I do know that that whole process through the board can take significantly longer <laughs> for the return on investment efficiencies that you can tangibly show, uh, but still wheels don't necessarily move. So um, you and I are both potentially frustrated by the same. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, we can talk about legal technology adoption and that sort of thing for, for a while and hours and um, yeah. uh, why it hasn't perhaps been adopted as quickly as it might have been um, given, even though there are gains to be made. Uh, it's a curious thing. That sounds like another episode. Yeah, just about <laughs> as I think. <laughs> but it is. It's an important piece, I think, as the technology is catching up. Mm. Um, you know how how that can be served in yeah. a more user friendly way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So disestablishment has hit many over COVID, me included. You contributed to a piece in the NZ Herald back in June uh, twenty, which was titled "Redundancy." the biggest mistake employees make when jobs on the line. How, if at all, have company actions or your advice changed since then? I think the advice that I would give remains the same. Uh, and yeah. the, the key thing there is that employees have to contest the decisions or at least go into bat for themselves. And um, yeah. uh, I, I suppose what I see sometimes is employees shrugging their shoulders and saying, well, um, this is going to happen. They've made their decision already. Uh, you know, it's COVID. Uh, so the employer has a good reason why they need to make a change and I'm just going to roll over and oh, yeah, well, I'll move on. Um, and unfortunately that I don't think is the right approach. I think that the right approach is to engage and to say, mm -hmm. okay, is the fact that COVID has, has hit, is that really a good rationale for why there needs to be a change? And if there does need to be a change, why is it this change and not some other change? And even if mm. there is my role to go, you know, I might be one of three who do that thing. Why am I being singled out? You know, there's a series of questions. Um, and I think I wrote a blog post about it, you know, three questions to ask if faced with redundancy, because I wanted people to think through, Hey, look, it's not, it's not a fait accompli, really. Um, yeah, there are cases, of course, where employers make up their mind and they're never going to change their mind. And they're entitled to have mm. a view, um, but they're also obliged to listen to you. They're obliged to listen to what you have to say about the situation and to take that on board and see whether or not it changes their mind. And you might have some ideas about the way the business is operating or where costs can be saved. 
uh, or you know questions around um, where um, um, money might else be saved for if, if it's a cost saving type um, scenario that you're into um, that they may not have thought of and unless you bring it to the table you're not going to be able to um, have have the benefit of perhaps that idea that um, might change their mind so i think it's uh, really important that people don't just give up they do think through why is this why is this a, a the right approach for the company to take and um and and you know make some good arguments and contest it um otherwise employers will simply um say well uh, you didn't turn up you didn't give us any ideas so why would we change our mind we'll just proceed with what we've proposed and they're entitled to do that they're entitled to have a view about the way um, the company should go and um and unless you've pitched in and given them something to chew on they'll just move on with that which is understandable so um the other thing i think uh, to bear in mind is that you know moving on from a role isn't necessarily the end of the world uh, and i've had plenty of, of clients who have moved on from roles and um, been moved on as, as you might say in terms of redundancy mm. uh, and i've seen them in the street later on and they said you know what mark it was really bad at the time it, it yeah. was really terrible but uh having looked back on it now it was the best thing that ever happened to me i remember a guy yeah. who was made redundant from a, a, a fit out firm and then i saw him in the street he was fitting out a place down the road here and uh he said oh you won't believe how it's all gone for me i've got my own firm now i'm running my own business and i'm loving it and yeah. you never quite know what's around the corner do you and i exactly that's that's um a theme i suppose we should all take from from this time of turbulence is that there are opportunities to be uncovered um mm. there is so much that is possible these days with technology with new types of jobs coming online that we've never had before um you know you can uh, go out there and potentially uh, create roles or find a niche that maybe never existed before and um that's kind of exciting i think uh, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy but there may be opportunities out there, I suppose, that are yet to be uncovered and maybe it's okay. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think because sometimes when you are in that position or you're giving everything and then you feel like you've lost control um, by being told no, or this is not what you'll be doing anymore, um, it's, uh, you forget that there is opportunity in other places but you've been so busy that you haven't seen it before so mm. sometimes yeah absolutely being able to shut off the noise is something that that potentially wasn't the best thing for you does open up those brand new doorways and and paths and makes you look a little bit more um intently as to what what could work better absolutely absolutely i think the other thing that surprised me when i left the law firm <clears throat> mm -hmm. was to see how many people were out there doing legal work that weren't in a law firm context right um, and you know when you um and so I, I think that's what happens isn't it when you're in a job or in a firm yeah. all you can see is sort of work that that firm does uh the concerns that that firm has and their clients and you don't really give too much thought to if i jump out of here how big of a world there is still out there that other people have got all these pockets and niches that they're dealing with and helping people in and um, so that was a real surprise to me in the sense of when i moved and to see how much work is actually out there that those firms don't even touch uh, yeah and uh so I, I suppose that across that applies across the board <clears throat> to any industry really and um uh it's just a matter of tapping into that finding your yeah. niche and yeah that's right coming down yeah so how has COVID changed or impacted the type of work you do and how have you adjusted? Yeah, um, I would say, I mean, a lot of people say to me, oh, you must be really busy with, you know, COVID related matters. And certainly when COVID hit, there was a flurry of activity because we had the, um, you know, the, um, the wage subsidy come in, uh, people trying to work out like, how does that work? How do we apply that to our business? Um, do we need to make change right now? 
that kind of thing. And some were just making changes and saying we need to we need to move because they had to. They were really vulnerable industries. Mm. Um, so yes, there has been a change in the type of work we've done around that. But since COVID, since it's calmed down, I suppose in terms of the lockdowns and that sort of thing, and, and life has sort of come back to somewhat of a, a norm. Um, I would say um, the key change from you know everyone has been you know working from home that sort of thing a bit more and considering yeah. how to work <laughs> best. Um, I personally um, work from home is um, been a little bit difficult with young kids, um, yeah. but um, uh, I'm sort of thinking about okay, how can I work from home? Uh, I've got an office pod that I uh, put in the in the backyard as part of a renovation we're doing on a house, and so thinking okay, how can I make my life more streamlined to um, work better for the family, also avoid some traffic, uh, and yeah. and, um, and you know and still be connected and doing the work that is required of me. Which is totally doable now. We all know that it can be done. Um, mm. there's, it's interesting to see how the courts have adopted um, technology to, uh, yeah. you know, facilitate hearings. Um, they've been very, um, they were very readily, uh, readily, um, and willing to, um, to to do that when when COVID hit and to allow people to uh, appear via video. So mm. it'll be interesting to see how much of that carries on. Um, but I, it also has made me realize that there's quite a bit of stuff that I do that is best done face to face, uh, you know, like mediations, for example, when you have, there's nothing like sitting down across a table, looking someone in the eye and, and trying to resolve a problem, uh, as opposed to doing it over the phone or over zoom. Um, they have their merit to some extent, but it, it, there's, there's that human to human interaction, uh, mm. that you sort of can't beat. And I think that's probably. Um, similar to court hearings, there's something about, you know, addressing a judge um, in the court that you can't quite replicate in the same way in other, in other forms. So um, I suppose um, it, it's made me realise the importance of some of that human to human interaction, but then where you can um, maximise or make use of the um, remote work type um, uh, ability that we have now you know, we've realized that there is a place for that too. And it's trying to find a balance and, and decide, okay, what's most important for some of these things? How, what's the best way to do something? Um, and we have a, now we have a slew of options. We have some tools in our toolbox mm. to be able to do that, which is really great. You've not had the unfortunate incident of turning up to uh, a hearing as a cat. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, that made me laugh. That was an awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was a, that was a great one, but I can totally imagine, um, some of our practitioners uh, grappling with the technological side of things yeah. and that, that yeah. kind of happening. So, yeah. Yeah, I have, as a, because I've got, as I said, that history within Laura, I have heard of some um, who are employing their children to ensure the setup's all right yeah. before they, they need to enter it. Yeah, that's right. There's been a lot of um, family tech support. Uh, there has uh, been, yeah. yeah. True. <laughs> When should someone seek specialist employment law assistance and what's one thing you wish clients would do better before engagement? Sure. I think it's whenever someone feels, has that gut feeling that they'll be, they're being treated unfairly. You know, there's something not quite right about the situation. Often your intuition is probably right. Um, sometimes you're not right. And sometimes I have clients who come to me and say, Am I, is this fair? And I say, yeah, it is fair actually. Uh, and then, but at least they know. Um, but often, yeah. um, often is the case that you feel like you're being treated unfairly. There's something behind that, and you just want to address. And that's totally the time to pick up the phone and, and see if um, you do need to take it further or have some assistance to take that further. Um, in terms of what clients would do, I wish I suppose that they would uh, more consider consider more carefully the exact goal they have in mind in terms of what they want out of a situation. Um, when a client is clear about what they want to achieve, then we can help them strategize to get to there. Mm. Um, often, um, I find that clients can have this maybe amorphous goal of just teaching their employers a lesson. They want their employer to, um, when well, I'm talking about employee clients, of course, um, yes. they want to teach their employer a lesson and say, okay, I want to hold them to account because even if I'm not going to be there anymore, at least they'll teach, you know, it'll teach them lessons so that they'll treat other people well in the future. And I think that's an admirable goal. And I hear that quite often, but I often think mm. to myself, um, unless you've got a really large wallet, 
um, it's probably not you worth usually taking that risk. Um, and because I, I'm just not convinced that necessarily one person uh, taking it to them is going to change um, the way employers deal with other employees. It's just not a certain goal. And so I think mm. if you if you put that aside, if you think just about yourself, what is your goal? What is what are you going to um, get out of this uh, in terms of um, is it worth your time and effort and cost and risk? Um, and we help you through that analysis, strategize to get there. And um, hopefully you end up with a, a good outcome that then you're happy with either whether it's staying with your employer or moving on. Either way, um, it's it's basically working with what you want to achieve. And so yeah, if that's if clients are clear about that, then that's that's really helpful for us. I think that's not just a fantastic piece of advice for seeking employment law assistance, but for your career and business in general. So yeah. thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, well, that's, that's probably, probably fair. <laughs> yeah. What have you learned about business and employment relationships in the work that you perform? And what advice would you give from that? Yeah, well, at the root of uh, employment relationships in New Zealand and the law, um, at the root of it is what is known as good faith. And people probably often yeah. hear the term good faith, but don't really know what that means. But at the end of the day, it just means that you're trustworthy. Are you a trustworthy type of person? Uh, as an employer, are you trustworthy in the way that you deal with your staff? And as an employee, are you a trustworthy employee? Can your employer trust you to do the right thing uh, in your role? And um, the stronger that bond of trust is between an employer and employee, the better it's gonna go. And when there are things that an employer and it's, let's face it it's probably like any relationship isn't it yeah um, you know, <laughs> i'm like uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> if you feel like you can't trust the person it's yeah. it doesn't go well and so um so I, I guess that's the insight that if you think about employment um as a relationship it is a relationship mm. it's one it's one of the other relationships you have in your life an important one and do you want to be a trustworthy participant in that relationship um then that's going to be uh, really um, a good um, good way of um, one improving your business or improving your career because you're going to be singled out as someone that is going to stand out uh, or an employer that people are going to want to work for. Um, and if that if that's the frame in which you um, you sort of um, make your decisions through, then that's uh, I think a really really valuable one. And it's kind of basic, but we overlook it because I don't know. We I guess we think of employment law as more complex than that. But at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's fantastic. Yeah, I I love all of that. <laughs> 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 What's the most challenging aspect of your work, and how do you unplug from it? Yeah, I think for me, it's about the workload and the time pressures. So uh, you know, I talk about litigation, people being a little bit um, quirky and perhaps really focus in on their work and that kind of thing. And I, I didn't, yeah. sort of didn't like that, but um, here I am probably like that. Uh, and, <laughs> um, and I guess it comes with the territory because there are deadlines, there are time pressures. Um, there would be a court deadline or a, an important thing you've got to try and achieve for your client by a certain time frame. Um, and so that ends up um, uh, putting some pressure on you as a, as a advisor. Um, yeah. And the other thing is that we are always conscious of when we're advising someone in the process of a, a dispute, for example, that uh, we've got an eye to how the court's going to look at what is going on. If this becomes a, a legal issue that has to be decided by a judge or an authority member, um, how are they going to view the correspondence we write? Uh, how are they going to you know, view the documents that are put together? All of that kind of yeah. thing. So, uh, it's always with an eye to the future, an eye to thinking about the context of how this would be assessed from a, um, from a judge's point of view. And so I guess that that always is in the back of your mind and that always is creating some sort of pressure around making sure you've got this right for this client. And mm. um, so, you know, uh, perhaps clients don't necessarily understand that that's how we're thinking about things, but that is exactly how we have to think about things so that we are advising in the best way uh, possible. So. I suppose that's that's probably um, the challenge of the work, but it's also, um, I guess, the joy of it as well is when you do advise someone well and you get a good outcome. That's a 
that's pretty cool. Um, unplugging from it, I suppose, is the difficulty is, you know, just spending time with family, just putting the work down, you know, making sure you have mm. your time off on the weekends um, and having other interests and community that you have around you. Um, just drawing those lines and saying to clients, look, I can't, I can't do it. Uh, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't have the capacity. So um, just managing expectations, I think, is really important too. Yeah, it is. It's, it's difficult because it's a very vulnerable time in people's lives. And so there is a sense of responsibility and um, definitely not exactly the same. But from a recruitment perspective, I, I feel that too. You know, people are um, really invested in, in trying to put their best foot forward and, and gaining this role and you want to get the best talent for clients. So I appreciate where those different pieces mix and in, in the same type of way. Yeah, true. What do you love? What do you love about your work and what's next for you? Mm. Well, I do really enjoy being able to help rather than we just talked about, you know, that satisfaction yeah. you get a kick out of when something's gone well, whether it's for an employer or an employee, uh, to be of service to people in a time of need is just, um, you know, there's something cool about that. You know, I step into people's lives in a moment and then I step out of it again, kind of like, and, uh, but I've, I've, we've shared something or we've been able to um, coach them through or, or strategize through that little difficult patch. And uh, I just, that's, that's cool. That's pretty cool. A pretty, um, uh, pretty nice feeling, I suppose. Um, yeah. and it's not, not something that a lot of people get to do. No. Um, I do have a lot of clients who say, yeah, really nice to meet you, Mark, but I hope I never have to deal with you again, you know, that kind <laughs> of thing. And, you know, I, I get that, um, yeah. you know, that they don't, as much as it's been a kick for me, you know, they don't want to have to deal with me again if they can avoid it. Um, but, you know, it, it's, you know, seeing them from when they first come in the door and maybe quite mm. um, strung out and, and worried about how things are going to go to the end result is, um, and hopefully it's a good one. That's, that's really the, the pleasure you get out of um, the work that we do. Yeah. Um, as to what's next, um, I, I've, I'm conscious of a, Quip that a guy called Mark Andreas in, in the States, uh, he's a, a, an investor, has said that uh, 10 years ago he wrote an article called Software is Eating the World. And uh, I guess what that means is that everything is being enhanced and helped uh, by software and by code. And um, I guess I'm wanting to apply that to my business uh, and using a variety of tools to help feed that in so that my um, mundane decisions are sort of taken care of or automated um, by software yeah. that I'm not having to think about those things, but I'm, I'm, I'm using my brain power to think about the things that are important to clients, about the strategy, about the legal decisions that have to be made and, um, and that's the better use of my time. So that's, a, I guess, a, a business application, isn't it? Really, it's not just a legal um, issue, one for lawyers to deal with, it's everyone across the board has to, you know, perhaps make use of that opportunity to use software where we can um, to really then hone in on the stuff that we're made to do, you know, and um, yeah. and get get real enjoyment out of. So, yeah, that's that's so true. There are black and white decisions um, that are absolute, and then elements that require the soft skills that we can bring in the understanding and um, context of mm. each of those different situations. So that makes total sense. What main gaps do you see between employers and employees or candidates? Uh, yeah, for me, the gaps that I see often come up are around expectations. And whether that's because employers don't necessarily always uh, specify what their expectations are, uh, and perhaps that's from the outset, from recruitment outset, maybe they sell it in a way that isn't quite uh, what they actually want. Um, mm. and, you know, and so the candidates ended up with this kind of vision of, oh, this is what this job's going to be like, and it hasn't actually turned out that way. Um, or it's just that it's morphed over time, or it's that they want it in a, done in a particular way, but they never quite say how they want it done. Um, yeah. And so <laughs> what happens often is that employees will sit on that stuff, either because they're too busy, right. or they don't want the confrontation. And... Uh, they'll, they'll sit on it, sit on it, sit on it, and one day they'll just explode in the sense of, um, and I'm not saying this happens all the time, of course, but uh, mm. cases that I deal with, often it's the case where something's exploded, uh, you know, and the relationship then is one of distrust, 
uh, mm. and um, either they've gone off their nut at someone and that employee didn't even see it coming uh, or um, they haven't articulated the expectations in such a way that the employee would understand why they're not meeting them. And um, so that misunderstanding about expectations, uh, I think, is a really common one. I, my view is that if an employer is doing their job well, the employee shouldn't be shocked at the end of the day mm. if the employer's decision is, to be, you know, after going through a fair process and having gone through a justified, um, justifiable um, uh, decision making around the employee's um, performance, that at the end of the day, um, if the employer turns around and says, sorry, I'm going to have to let you go because you're not meeting your expectations. The employee should at the end of that go, yeah, I can, I can see why you're saying that. And it's, yeah. it's stink and I'm, I'm really sad about that, but I can understand it. That mm -hmm. ideally is the acknowledgement that you would hope uh, a fair employer would have um, from an employee at the end of that process. So uh, that's the, I guess, the, the goal. <laughs> um, and, and what it means is it requires a bit more work on the part of employers. Uh, yeah. to really articulate that stuff. And probably also employees also, let's face it, it's a two way yeah. street, to put up their hand and say, look, you've asked for this in a certain way and you've said it's not right. Well, tell me exactly, how do I how do I do it in such a way that you are happy with? Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, let's face it, employees are gonna find that some employers just don't wanna give them the time. Um, yeah. um, there's personalities involved and for whatever reason, they don't get the information around uh, how to do the job well and meet those expectations. Um, uh, and that's where things sort of fall apart. It's 9.30. Yeah. So. Yeah. What's a key piece of advice you have for candidates when considering a new role offer? Um, I suppose for me, um, it's not just to think about it in terms of a pay increase or a, um, it, it's perhaps to think about it as how will this allow me to grow? What other uh, perhaps tangential opportunities that might arise out of this job that um, I wouldn't otherwise have received if I didn't take it. So, you know, there might be people you end up mixing with or networking with that are really interesting people. And they might lead you off into a different direction than this, even this job is expecting you to go. Uh, and that could be really just an exciting sort of um, prospect. So, um, and again, you know, I talked about earlier about the um, learning from good people, you know, learning from a range of people because you pick and, yeah. pick and choose those sorts of things and absorb stuff from people that you work with um, um, just by osmosis, as you said. And that, um, you know, I suppose if you're going to do that, you want to work with people that you're going to admire and mm -hmm. the sort of people you think you can, um, will want to work with and learn from in that way. So who are you learning? from how do you think it's going to make you grow? What sort of opportunities tangentially might arise because you've taken this job? Um, and um, obviously remuneration at the end of the day is you've got to put the bread on the table. Um, that's obviously yeah. a factor. But um, but if, you, if you're blessed with more than one option that you know, the, the rate of pay is going to be somewhat equivalent, you know, mm. these other factors are going to be really important. And it can be a, a short term consideration, you know, in terms of that negotiation. If I prove myself in this time, I've got this offer, we can write this in. Um, yeah, so many factors, but it has to be a long term goal, doesn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you had to career change tomorrow, what would you do? Yeah, I'd probably do something in a startup space around legal tech. Um, you know, or business process automation, something, something around that, um, dealing with processes and pro probably dealing with, uh, automating some processes in the legal space. I think that would be, um, there's definitely opportunity out there to, to, um, to make that happen. There's a lot of, uh, startups dealing with issues in the legal world, access to justice is part of that as well. And mm. um, so, uh, I think I would probably be doing something along those lines. I was at the New Zealand FinTech Hui at the end of last week. And so lots of discussions with regards to open banking, integration, consumer data rights, uh, startups versus banks and, and those um, tense and 
possibly advantageous relationships depending on how that mix works and and then also moving into that insurance tax space so you know i really feel that legal is is an element of that and we had a speaker um representing from the legal perspective around yeah some of the areas of regulation so i, I and i think personally i just think legal is such a, a huge part of that the finance, um, insurance, and legal bodies all integrate so very nicely. So plenty of opportunities coming up uh, for that potentially, Mark. Yeah, definitely. I agree. <laughs> Just finding the time, eh? So. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. How do you think employment law will change in the next decade? There's definitely a shift, I think, to um, recognizing rights of dependent contractors. So Uber drivers, that sort of thing. We've had a case come out recently in the employment court that found that an Uber driver was not a employee, um, but a contractor. And because the argument the Uber driver was making was like, I'm an employee effectively of Uber because um, they're telling me what to do every day. Effectively, they're, they're the other mm. ones paying me. Um, and everyone knows I work for Uber, so why am why am I not an employee? And there's this is a legal test around that that the courts the courts apply. But um, I think there is a growing sense in which people um, like Uber drivers, those in the gig economy, uh, may not be getting the the fairest treatment. Um, you know, they can be dropped at the you know at the drop of a hat. Um, their rates of pay may change kind of without too much um, negotiation. And uh, so I think there's a move to have rights recognised for uh, people like that. And in the UK, there is actually a category of workers uh, that they do recognise um, as not being employees, but not mm -hmm. purely contractors either. That in, in between, they have some basic rights like holidays and rest breaks and that sort of thing that are recognised by, um, by way of law. So I think we'll probably end up going down a path like that. I think there's going to be enhanced uh, statutory assistance for employees going forward, particularly vulnerable employees. I think um, mm. uh, we're starting to see some of that uh, increase already. So increased benefits around uh, minimum wage, so getting up to the living wage level, uh, where um, I think it's been mooted that sick leave will increase uh, to 10 days from next year. So you'll have 10 days per year as opposed to five. Uh, we've had family violence leave introduced, which allows people to have 10 days leave off each year um, if they've uh, been uh, experienced family violence. Um, 26 weeks uh, paid parental leave has it's been increased to that level um, from 18, I think it was previously. So um, we've got a new public holiday coming out, Matariki, uh, which will be introduced, I think, from next year from, um, from what I hear. So there's all these um, enhanced benefits, I think, we're, we're experiencing around um, ensuring employees have um, those basic protections and in, 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 in an enhanced way. Also around um, restraints of trade, I think we may well see those curbs. So you know, and from a recruitment perspective, that's of interest because you know having people move easily between jobs um, is something that comes up probably quite often. And mm -hmm. uh, I believe um, what we might end up seeing is um, some curbing of uh, the ability to restrain people unless you pay them. Um, so in Europe, right, yeah. uh, it's quite common for restraints of trade to only be enforced if the employer pays some or at least part of their pay for the period for which they're restrained. So that could be something to watch as well. So I think though it is, it is a trend to recognising more worker rights um, and freedom of, of work. And um, I think we'll just be carrying along in, in that vein. Yeah, and there's a lot there, I think, also... Um leveraging towards well-being in general yes. uh, you know there's there's a, a push of this work-life balance has been shifted so people now have so much work from home and they find it very difficult to um create those boundaries but yeah mm. really interesting pieces to keep an eye out for mm. um so to round off is there anything else you'd like to share any last words or stories to leave us with mark yeah, well, I think just coming back to that idea of um, opportunity and uh, what's available in terms of legal te or technology in general. But uh, for me, you know, I think about it in the legal space. Uh, you know, it's amazing what is possible, you know. Um, I mean, you know, podcasts or blogging or Twitter feeds, you know, like the amount of communication we can have out there. You know, I, I did do a blog um, and I still have it up there, obviously, on my website, um, yeah. where I blogged for a, a year and a half 
pretty much straight weekly for a year and a half. Um, I haven't been doing as much recently. I'd like to do more. Um, but what that did in terms of presenting opportunities for me uh, by simply getting my thinking out there and engaging with mm. people, you know, I have lawyers ring me up and say, oh, you know, you wrote that blog about so and such and such and, you know, we start off a conversation and employees or employers who contact me asking me about a question I've written about. So, yep. you know, the opportunity is there. If you want to publish your, your thinking and have it out there, you know, or your interactions and engage with others, there's so much possibility around that, you know, and I applaud yeah. you for what you're doing with this this podcast is exactly that, you know, reaching out yeah. to people, uh, getting their thoughts, inter- interacting with them. And I just think um, there's uh, a lot we can do, uh, you know, um, to further that. Uh, the opportunity is there and um, it's a great, um, great way to, uh, you know, I guess further um, the likelihood of serendipitous uh, connections and um, and what comes from that. So I think, why not go for it? Well, it's amazing. I think you're absolutely right. Connection, particularly here in New Zealand, we have opportunities that so many in the world don't to connect across a wide range of people and specialists. Um, but for me, this is also about finding your tribe and letting people know what you stand for. And, and that's exactly what your blog would have done as well. Um, so you'll have a lovely blog entry, you know, with the link to this podcast that can share a little bit more of that for you. There, Absolutely. Perfect. <laughs> this has been amazing. I, um, yeah, thank you so much for your time.